this is the kind of message that I hesitate to give because uh, it's about victory and joy in the Lord. It's about being an overcomer. It's about living a life beyond our circumstances. The reason I hesitate to give it is because I'm not always really good at it. And uh, it's just another example, week after week, of the message being higher than the messenger. But thank God for that. Uh, you don't want me giving messages <laughs> that uh, only live up to myself. God's given us such a higher and more beautiful path than, than our own ways, right? Uh, if Brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian, and by Christian I mean somebody who's seen their sin, they know they've thought terrible things, they've used this voice that God gave them. The Bible, we just saw today in Sunday school, by the way, we have a wonderful Sunday school class every morning for the adults up here at uh, what, 845? 845. In the scriptures, are, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, you're commanded to sing. Actually, we're commanded to shout. So let's make a sing and shout. Be joyful in our expression to the Lord. Because if you're a Christian, and by Christian, I mean somebody who knows that they have sin, but not just say, well, that's the way I am. Deal with it. They know their darkness. They know their temptations. They know their weaknesses. And they turn to God and say, Father, I don't deserve forgiveness, but I believe your son Jesus Christ died for my mess that he took responsibility for my garbage, that my sins were there, poured upon him at the cross. My sins are, are nailed to that cross. Father, I trust you to forgive me. And God forgives us because that's what he does. That's what he wants to do. That's why uh, Christ came into the world. So if you've seen your wickedness and you've said, Father, forgive Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross for me. Your ways are higher than my ways. I want to follow you, Jesus. If that's you, then listen to me. No matter how sad your life gets, no matter what uh, trauma you've gone through, what hardships you've gone through, what hardships await us just beyond the horizon or just in the next step, uh, you are victorious. Now, there's a sense in which every Christian's a loser. Bear with me. Because only losers find themselves at the foot of the cross. If you say, I got my act together, I'm righteous all by myself, that's what self-righteous is, I'm okay, good without God, if, if, we're, if we're that confident in ourselves, we will not find ourselves at the foot of the cross. The foot of the cross is for people who say, I lose God, you win, I surrender. But after that, if you are a Christian, you are a victor. That's the definition of your life. Not, my life is not defined by failed relationships. My life is not defined by bank accounts. My life is not de defined by popularity contests. Our lives are defined by the victory we receive through Jesus Christ. See, God gave us, a, gave us the end of the story. It's like going fast forward on the old VCR, you know, see the numbers go, go, go. I just want to see the end of the story. Oh, good guys win. Guys, we win. You win. <clears throat> there are terrible things we go through in this life. Some of it human beings do to one another. <clears throat> if you can think of a terrible torture, something terrible to do to somebody, it's almost a guarantee that somebody in history has done that to somebody. The, the human beings have gone nowhere on the planet where shortly after the ground didn't drink human blood. We bring violence everywhere we go. Now you may be saying, well, nobody, uh, or I know I've killed anybody. Oh, we're violent in our thoughts. We're, we're, we're violent with our tongues, totally eviscerating people, tearing them apart, uh, using the tongue that God gave us to praise him to tear down other people, put them down as if that's our responsibility. Brothers and sisters, no matter what we've gone through, no matter where we're going, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a victor. That's how you should see yourself. That's how you should define your life. We're not victims. We're not failures. We're not, we're not people that, that uh, are going to lose everything and lose out in the end. In the end, 
we win because Christ wins. We have paradise where everything makes sense, where all the tears are wiped away. 1 John 5, 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Born of God, we're talking about reborn, the second birth, becoming a Christian. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. <clears throat> this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. But in this life, we also share Christ's sufferings. And that's the, that's the balancing act here. Romans 8, 17 says, Co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings. Co-heirs with Christ, if we share in his sufferings. In order that we may also share in his glory. Now, that's the part of Scripture that I don't like. You ever come across parts of the Bible you don't like? If not, you're not reading it enough. <laughs> I come across stuff all the time, and then, oh man, God. We are co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory. There's a sense in which the suffering we have here on earth increases our glory in heaven. What do you think this means? If we share in his sufferings, we share in order that we share in his glory. What do you think that means? How would, how would you preach on that? Don't answer. Have you suffered for Christ? Now, I'm not talking about, oh, well, I've had this cough for the last year. No, that's not suffering for Christ. I'm not talking about stubbing your toe. Christians, non-Christians get heart disease. Christians, non-Christians, break their toes, especially Adam, who's broken them all multiple times. Like nobody else I know. <laughs> there's some struggles that are common to everybody. And there's some struggles we bring upon ourselves. Uh, because we're mean. We're nasty. We say some... We're, we're, we're difficult to be around and wonder why we don't have friends. We drink too much and wonder why we keep falling down on the sidewalk. You know, there are, there are troubles we bring upon ourselves, but there are struggles that we can have only if we're Christians. You know, people that give in to temptation all the time say, temptation doesn't bother me. It's got no hold on me. No, because you don't know the power of temptation. You've never re tried to resist it. Only when we try to resist temptation, we see there's a struggle there to deny myself and say, say yes to God. But I want it. Yeah? Two-year-old. <laughs> There's struggles when we want our loved ones to know Jesus, and they don't want to hear about it. There's struggles when we try to put God first in relationships, in economics, our, where we live, what we do. Put God first. There are struggles, there are sufferings that we can have simply because we want to follow Christ. And I'm not even talking about persecution from the world. So what kind of suffering have you done for Christ? Now, Romans 8.1 tells us we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The one who loved us is, we're talking about Jesus, right? He died for us. Uh, rose again to give us new life. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, here's the interesting thing about being a conqueror. To, be a, to take over a city, there's got to be a city there in the first place. To tear down strongholds, there's got to be a stronghold there in the first place. This is the part of the equation that we often skip that I don't like. To be conquerors, there has to be something to overcome. Well, I just want an easy life. And you know what? Because I'm such a wonderful person, that's pretty much what I desire for you guys, too. I want you guys to have easy lives. It, 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 it's sad for me when, when folks in the congregation are going through health issues, financial issues, relationship issues. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us, even in the bad times. Actually, because of the bad times. 
To be victorious, we have to triumph over something, right? An easy life is a blessing, and we should be thankful and we should enjoy good days when they're, when they're here. Uh, you know, how are you going to stand up in the hard days if you can't be thankful and appreciate the good days? But adversity does provide us an opportunity for God to get another win through us. When hard times come, say, okay, God, there's an opportunity for you to get a win. What if we could show the hospital staff what it looks like to be a Christ follower through this difficulty? What if it looks like if we can keep our marriage together and rejoice through this financial hardship? What would it look like? How could we, well, how could we let God have a victory through us even though my life is falling apart all around me. See, when there's struggle, there's opportunity for victory. When there's no struggles, that's a nice day. But there's no victory to be had. Uh, I don't want any of us to have struggles. Strangely, Paul actually says he wants fellow Christians to have struggles. I don't think I'm comfortable saying that unless uh, you're Paul or another writer of Scripture and the Holy Spirit's flowing through you. Romans 8 tells us well, we're more than conquerors. Through him who loved us, we're conquerors because of the love of Jesus Christ. We're not conquerors because we have our acts together. Uh, A-C-T-S, not A-X or A-X-E, depending on how you spell it. We have our acts together together. Uh, because uh, we, we have our acts together because of what Christ has done for us. If you believe in Christ, the reasonable thing to do is to fall at his feet and worship him. I mean, that's just common sense. I was going to hell. I was under the weight of my sin. I was separated from everything good. And now I'm going to heaven. I'm completely forgiven. I'm completely accepted. That's... This is not a difficult mathematical equation. The reasonable thing to do is to fall down and say, thank you, God, I'm going to live each day for you. That's the reasonable thing. That makes sense. To, to worship him with everything inside of us, and, and that's probably why the Psalms say to shout out joyfully to the Lord, to sing joyfully to the Lord. When God says to sing, we've got a choice, to sing or not sing, right? Sing out to the Lord. Matthew 2.11, uh, in, in going into the house... They saw the child with Mary, his mother. This is the, the, the three wise men, the three guys from Mesopotamia. The child is Jesus. Right at the beginning of his life, they saw him, and the Bible says, and they fell down and worshipped him. They fell down before Christ and worshipped him. Uh, worship is, is not a, a magic word. It, it's like adoration. They adored him. Everything wonderful, everything good, everything worthwhile. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They, they worshipped him with their treasures. Matthew 14, when Jesus walked on water, his, his uh, disciples saw it. And those in the boat, his disciples, worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It didn't mean none of these people didn't have problems. It meant they saw Jesus for who he is, and they worshipped. Matthew 28, 9, right after his resurrection, Jesus appeared first to a group of women. The Bible says, and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took a hold of his feet. That means they got down low and they worshipped him. And so we see that after his birth and after his death and resurrection, people worshipped him, and he allowed them to worship him. A good philosopher would never allow, a good teacher would never allow anybody to worship them. The disciples didn't allow anybody to worship them, as we saw last week. But he allowed them to worship. And his own disciples, those who were with him all the time and knew him best, they worshipped him and he allowed it. I once got a, a really good scientist, a really good compliment from a scientist who worked at Procter & Gamble and he came to uh, my church in Japan, and he, he said, uh, Dan, I respected you before, but now that I see how the people who are with you all the time like you, I respect you even more. 
Well, Jesus was with the people, the people who he was with all the time, they fell down and worshiped and said, you're God. The people that are with you all the time would know he ain't God. Would know if this person's got hang-ups, this person's got problems. The people who were with him all the time fell down and worshiped and said, truly, you are the son of God. And then in John 20, 28, Doubting Thomas, he's called Doubting Thomas for a reason, met the resurrected Jesus Christ, and he had said, I'm not going to believe. I, I can't believe he rose again. He falls down and says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus allowed him to do this. This is in contrast to Peter. We remember when the Roman uh, centurion Cornelius, and we remember what we said about Cornelius? You can't find anything that rhymes with it. When, <laughs> when the Roman centurion Cornelius meets him, he falls down to worship. But Peter didn't take this as an opportunity to be a big deal. You know, we said this last week. In all the old movies, when the, when the, when the people start to worship you and the tribe or the country starts to worship you, you can make a little hay out of it, you know. Uh, Peter, they, they fall down to worship, but Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up, I too am a man. Didn't allow it. Then last week we saw Paul and Barnabas worshipped as Hermes and Zeus by this huge crowd of people, and the priests of Zeus were going to offer sacrifices to them, and they actually tore their clothes, and they cried out. They ran into the, uh, the, the mob, and they cried out because they loved the people. They came to point the way to heaven. The people were going to worship them instead of Jesus. That doesn't get you saved. People liking you, respecting you, loving you can't get anybody saved. And they didn't fall into the trap of, of uh, praise. Uh, when, when, when non-believers praise you, it's often a trap because to keep their approval, you have to be more and more like them and deny more and more of the scriptures. They did not fall into the trap of praise. Instead, they tore their clothes and ran out into the crowd and cried out, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. And we also saw in Revelation where John tries to worship an angel. Now, that seems stupid, right? And, and uh, we, we talked about uh, Bede, the venerable Bede. We like to use his name. Uh, who He quoted, he said, that was a, a stupid thing to do. Uh, John tries to worship an angel. This angel must have been so glorious in comparison to his <laughs> earthly physical self. And the angel tells him, Stay on your knees, I'm all that there is. No. The angel says, I'm just a fellow servant of God. The angel didn't allow it. The apostles didn't allow it. Nobody allows them to be worshipped except Jesus. Knowing who Christ is, he's not just a good teacher, but God, our Savior, gives us the courage and the strength to live victorious lives even when they suck. We, we've got to know Jesus. Otherwise, where's our hope? In ourselves? Hopeless. Hope in our culture? The diary for our culture is the evening news. Turn on that for a moment and see how hopeful that is. Our victory does not depend on how the stock market is doing. Our victory does not depend on how our favorite sports team is doing. Go Pack. Uh, <laughs> or even how powerful or successful our nation is. Our victory is assured because of our victory in Jesus Christ. He conquered over death, he rose again, and he has promised us eternity with him. Now, a few moments ago, I quoted from Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Get ready, here's the context. Romans 8, 31 through 39. This is the Bible. God wanted you to hear this. God wants you to hear this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also, along with him, give us graciously all things that we need? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, 
who is raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or, persecu or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, all these things, the hardship, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the danger, the sword, the being slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We aren't talking about victory despite suffering, and I wish we were. But victory over suffering. Without hardship, there's nothing to overcome. Maybe that's why Paul said this really bizarre and kind of disturbing thing in Philippians 3.10. Listen to what Paul says. I want you to know Christ. Well, that's good. Good so far. I want you to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Amen? Amen. Paul says, I want you to know Christ and the power of resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Question mark, exclamation point, question mark, explanation point, question mark. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Paul. Remind me to ask you not to pray for me. <laughs> I want you to know Christ, good. I want you to know the power of his resurrection, good. And to share with Christ's suffering, he wants that for us. But why? And then he says, being conformed to him in his death. You could have stopped halfway through that verse. I would have been fine. I have to confess, I've never hoped that for any of you. But there it is in Scripture. Take it or leave it. Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. And as you do that, I want to suggest that the reason Paul and the early Christians experienced joy, because we, we counted the amount of times the word rejoice and gladness is in the, in the book of Acts. It's just this constant theme rolling through the book of Acts. Despite extreme hardships and persecution and hatred, is because their confidence was in Christ. Their confidence was not in themselves. Their confidence was not uh, in their culture. And they believed that Christ would reward their trust in him. Brothers and sisters, do you believe that? Amen. How are we going to get through the hard times unless we think Jesus sees and he will reward, that he will bless? And as we read Acts chapter 14, I want you to think, think about 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Our light in momentary troubles. Now this is written by a fellow that's shipwrecked a couple times, whipped, stoned until people thought he was dead. They threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. He eventually dies for his faith. He says, our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs all of our troubles. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. If we really believe this, that our light and momentary troubles are getting for us an eternal glory that's much greater than all of our troubles, I think it's going to matter how we face turmoil. And yes, I still pray that you face no turmoil. Let's think about this as we go through Acts chapter 14. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, 
who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. And we said that truth always divides, by definition. Wherever Christ goes, he's going to divide. Some people will choose the grace, will take the salvation, and some people are going to say, I can do without. I can do without God. Uh, There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus. We need to share the good news. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But, then the, but when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard about this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you the good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd to, from offering sacrifices to them. Then some of the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. When people put you up on a pedestal, it's only so you can be knocked down. Uh, the crowd is fickle. The love of the mob is fickle. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. And we said last week, you read that sentence, oh yeah, it's the Bible, next sentence. It was kind of a big deal for Paul. He was hit with rocks and beaten. He was bleeding from his head. He was, he was on the ground unconscious, and they thought he was dead, so they drug him outside the city. They only stopped because they thought he was dead. That was a rough day. I wonder if Paul ever thought, God, you could do something about this. He probably thought it, but it didn't change his attitude. But after the disciples had gathered around Paul, he got up and went back to the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the gospel. Okay, they left one place, they preached the gospel. Now they're leaving here and they're preaching the gospel. The gospel is the good news. Paul still believed in the good news after an unruly mob who one moment wanted to offer sacrifices to him and the next moment wanted to kill him And remember, again, this is the trap of praise. The world will love you if you do the way they want you to do, and they'll turn on you if you don't. But Paul still had a good message, a good news that God is real. He sees us in our real troubles. He really loves us, and Jesus died for your sins. Your sins can be forgiven, and heaven's doors are wide open. Christ rose from the dead, and we too will rise to eternal life through faith in him. Why did Paul believe this? Because he met the resurrected Jesus Christ, because many of his friends had met the resurrected Jesus Christ. This is why the early church could endure struggle and and, and ensure difficulty, because they knew who Jesus was, and they trusted him. They preached this good news, this gospel, in that city in one a large number of disciples. Listen, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. We can't win anybody to Christ if we don't talk to them about Christ. Right? Right? Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. What a wonderful thing to have the Apostle Paul uh, come back to your city after being run out, after being mistreated, after all these difficulties on this missionary journey, returning to places he had been, saying, stay strong in your faith. I hope that's your prayer, Sean. 
I hope that's your prayer, Allison. I hope that's your prayer, Stephen, uh, that all of us think about the people around us. Stay strong in your faith, Mike. You know, that, that's our desire for one another, Chie, that you're desiring that for your sisters. Norman, that you're desiring that for everybody in this church. Paul went encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Let's encourage one another to walk strong in our faith. Amen? Amen. We must go through many hardships. Paul, why do you, why'd you say that? And God, why do you put that in the Bible? I like remain true to your faith because we got a lot of good days ahead of us. We're going to have a lot of fun. You know what? I'm almost a hypocrite to preach this. Hypocrite to preach this. Well, I am a hypocrite, but that's different. But I've got such a good life, and I've had such a good life. Paul says we're going to have to go through a lot of hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Put that out on the sign, right? Come join us in going through many hardships on our way to the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders, plural. This is the idea of multiple pastors for church. We buy into that belief. We like that. Uh, multiple elders uh, for them in each church. And with prayer and fasting, because it's a very serious thing to appoint somebody to be a pastor, they committed these men to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. So this is historically every place they went. And every place they went, they talked about Jesus Christ. We can do that. Every place we go, you get a haircut, talk about Jesus. From, from uh, Attilia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had committed, where they had been committed to the grace of God uh, for the work they had now completed. So they started their missionary journey, went through all these chur uh, churches, uh, all these places in Turkey, planting churches, and now they come back to Syria. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, and how they had preached, uh, had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Guys, in ten days, Pastor Mike and his wife, Sue, are going to come here. They come here every year. We're going to gather the church together, and they're going to tell us all about how God has been opening a door for faith in Nepal. These things are exciting. That's, churches get together to hear about those things. It's a wonderful thing. And they stayed there a long time with all the disciples. That's, that would have been a good way to end the book of Acts. That's happily ever after. But on, uh, we know that it, it does end happily ever after, even though Paul dies. For his faith. Actually, newsflash, every Christian previous to these generations that we live in and right now have all died in their faith. Uh, but we know how the story ends. If we're going to go through hard times in this life, if we're going to go through the struggles and still be victorious like Paul and Barnabas and like the early church, we must know who our Savior is. We must be secure in our confidence of him. I want to end with a couple verses. John 16, 33. Jesus is talking. He says, in this world you will have trouble. That's a promise from Jesus. But here, the second part of the verse, listen. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's not what a really good teacher says. If your math teacher said that, she's off a rocker. <laughs> you know? uh, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And then James 1.12 Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Dear Heavenly Father, please stir up our hearts to love you in the good times and in the bad. Father, help us to be people of thanksgiving, people who rejoice. And Lord, I pray that we too We'll live lives fully committed to you, committed to encouraging our brothers and sisters to remain strong in their faith, and committed, Lord, to sharing the message of the cross with everyone we can, sharing the good news, Lord, to bring more people into your family. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.